Today, we're going to be talking about automated browser testing for Live View using Wallaby, um, and really where this fits in in the broader testing ecosystem here in Elixir. Uh, Alex or just did our, my intro, but I'm Burton Broderick, CTO of Savvy Solutions. Um, we're currently using Live View in production today for our internal admin tooling, as well as uh, in our client-facing application alongside React. Um, and I've been involved in the Elixir ecosystem for the last, last six years now. Um, you're here at the big Elixir, so I'm going to assume you're familiar with Live View. But uh, for the future here, it's part of the Phoenix framework that allows us to quickly build interactive uh, user experiences with less context switching between um, Elixir and JavaScript. And so we can deliver uh, a great user experience with a you know, mo more focused team. So why we use Live View? Uh, I already talked about this a little bit, but it minimizes context switching. Um, and so we had started uh, our application, the user-facing piece, in React. And uh, as those of you who are familiar with that ecosystem, you've seen really high levels of churn uh, in the core pieces of that framework, as well as along the testing tools. Um, and so most recently, we've settled into using Jest and Cypress for that. Um, but that means that your teams that you're building out have to have that expertise, both in uh, the React framework, as well as in that testing ecosystem that's constantly churning. And that becomes problematic if you're trying to run a small team like ours, where now those people <laughs> have a much harder time taking vacation, uh, or you know, the team has to deal with a lot more frustration when features come up. There's certain people that it inevitably gets pushed to, and we want to try and avoid that. And we've experienced since adopting Live View that uh, because the number of skills, the diversity of skills that we need in order to deliver a great user experience is reduced, we can use less specialized roles on each team and have smaller teams able to still deliver the value to the end users. Um, so as I mentioned, it's for us, it's been a better developer experience with less context switching, less variability in the skills that we need to uh, remember and maintain. And really the core of it is reduced cognitive load. The whole team doesn't have to keep quite as much technical minutia in their head or you know, readily available, they can focus on the domain and delivering that value for the end users. Uh, the other thing that we've noticed and that I'm gonna get more into as we continue this, but it gives you tunable levels of end-to-end -end control um, as you start testing. Uh, we're able to tune what level of database access we have as we test uh, third-party APIs, whether we're accessing real ones or mocks and then dealing with uh, non-deterministic function returns, uh, which for our business where we're interacting with a lot of uh, third-party hardware becomes a big deal um, to be able to handle those um, unhappy paths that are a little more rare. So before we get into Wallaby though, why bother with testing? This deserves its own talk, but I wanted to knock it out real quick. Um, and especially why bother with testing at the browser layer? Uh, and for me, this allows me to build applications and get faster feedback on what the user's attempting to accomplish and whether they can accomplish it as I'm writing software or as my teams are writing software. Uh, so I know for me that uh, a common flow is you, you make some changes, open up the browser, fill out the form or whatever, submit, see what's wrong, okay, go back to the code, fix. That, um, that can be a fair, fairly fast rhythm for a lot of developers. But I guarantee I can't fill out a form consistently in under a second over and over and over again. Um, just can't do it, can't tab over fast enough. Uh, and so that's where, um, where it becomes an advantage where you can start test driving your code to ensure you're delivering the value fast um, for your users. The other thing is if you're, if you're on a team that maybe doesn't practice testing or test-driven development a lot, this allows you to um, take what is a currently, hopefully, a manual QA process and start automating it because there's a chance that your uh, QA engineers in your team are going through and clicking through the application before you deploy to make sure um, that your application works. And in fact, there was a, a company that I worked with that had a um, deploy, pre-deploy checklist that had, took full eight business days between deploys. And so if you're getting feedback on that, you pass something over as a software engineer, feeling great, like this works, or maybe you were less than thorough, and I don't know if it's working, but you handed it over, it integrated with the rest of the changes, 
and you don't get feedback on that for possibly more than a week on whether or not that works, and that's really frustrating and disrupting to your flow. So you can start using browser testing in order to tighten those loops. <laughs> Which brings us to Wallaby. Um, so what Wallaby is, is a browser testing tool. It was started by Chris Keithley and has since been pitched, picked up by Mitch Hanberg, who's currently over at SimpleBet, so shout out to those folks for helping continue that good work. Uh, and what it does is gives you one more tool in your tool belt to ensure that your software works the way that you need it to. Um, and you no longer have to throw things over the wall to QA or software engineers in test. Um, writing code that works becomes your responsibility and that you have the tools to use um, because you no longer have to know about uh, Selenium or Java uh, frameworks or anything like that. You can stay in the comfort of Elixir. Um, so, uh, real quick, testing pyramid, because uh, no talk on testing is complete without it. Um, it gives you the ability, once again, to control what level of integration that you have. With Live View, you can control the entire stack here uh, from end to end. Database access, if you want real database returns, which for a more integrated test is going to be valuable, um, versus less integrated, if you want to actually interact with like a Stripe API, um, one of their sandboxes, or, with the, or fake that response, you can do that and control your testing experience. And all of this can, again, to speed up those feedback loops, be supported by a test watcher that'll watch for every time you save your files, recompile everything, and run your test suite. Uh, and there's you know, various tools, including Floki, uh, XUnit, and Hammocks that we might touch on a little later. Now, all of this so far has <laughs> been selling benefits, but there are trade-offs here with browser testing. Um, for me, on the pro side, you can be really confident in your code, especially on the live view side, because you control from the browser access uh, to the database layer that the paths that you're testing work appropriately. Um, now, obviously, there's still things that go, can go wrong. Your DNS can be misconfigured or something at your infrastructure layer, and you may want to uh, test that as well. Um, you can still test that in a little bit of a different way with, uh, with Wallaby, but you can also do all of your testing in a, like, again, controlled mix M v equals test type environment. It allows you to val validate non-user visible events. So if you're building an e-commerce platform and you need to ensure that emails are sent to the users with uh, their invoices uh, and the product SKUs and everything, you can do that using all of the regular testing tools that are available for testing email with Wallaby. And so that becomes a really seamless uh, interoperability, allowing you to, again, make sure that everything works. It's faster feedback than human QA, whether that human QA is you immediately at the browser or you know, weeks later, potentially, when other humans take it up and see, hey, is this working? Uh, and then we're going to get into this a little bit later, but I think it's very easy to start. Again, if your organization isn't familiar with testing, uh, getting started in the browser is a great place to start. You don't need to know anything else about uh, unit testing or philosophy of testing or anything. On the con side, though, it is going to make your test suite slower. You do have to boot up a full browser. That is a lot slower than um, your in-memory testing or even accessing the database. It's flakier, potentially. Uh, you, can, you have various tools to work around that, but that's reality, more points of failure. Maybe less familiar for a lot of folks. A lot of folks aren't familiar with doing browser-based testing. Uh, but I don't think that, uh, as I'll showcase, is a huge roadblock. And then the biggest one that I run into is that it's not my job. That's QA's job. And uh, once again, that's a whole separate talk. But I'm going to just say I disagree. Uh, delivering software is our job as software engineers. If it doesn't work, we're not doing our job. So. So how it gets easier from my perspective uh, that I touched on is it allows outside-in test-driven development. So maybe you have no idea uh, how to implement tests for the specific piece of functionality that you're working with. But uh, you do know that, uh, going back to our e-commerce example, you need to boot up a page. It needs to show all of the products. I need to add one to my shopping cart, and then I need to be able to check out. Congratulations, you have your first set of tests that you can now write. Uh, and that can be used to drive the rest of your application, whether this is greenfield or brownfield project. You can say, okay, 
um, if I'm using Live View here now, I know that I need a you know, route in the router to direct the products page. I know I need a Live View uh, that'll in, that will list all of my products. And then I need um, the context that'll pull that out of the database, et cetera, et cetera. And so that can be used to drive both your code as well as further tests if you like, um, depending again on your organization. But for me, that, uh, that ability to have my code tell me what, my, what I need to write and what it needs to look like, and then give me hints at where things may be a little bit ergonomically weird. If, uh, if the API that I've designed for the context to access those products doesn't quite fit right, um, my tests will help tell me that. <laughs> so, uh, and all this comes together for why live, test live view in the browser is this for me. Uh, there's plenty of times where you write code that wires up great in the unit test, you hook it together and it doesn't exactly work. Um, so that's you know, kind of the culmination of why we do uh, browser-based testing. Now we're gonna get into some examples here. I've got all the code available um, at uh, my username, Britain-JB, testing Live View Wallaby. Um, so all of that's available there. Uh, you don't need to follow along, but we'll be, we'll be going this way. Uh, so first thing, getting Wallaby set up. Uh, right now, this is uh, a little bit more effort than it needs to be, so I'm gonna be working on getting some PRs up to the, to the repo to do this, primarily around documentation, to make sure your whole test suite can run asynchronously. Um, but, but aside from that, the only other piece that really needs some love is telling you how to add Chrome driver uh, to your local environment. <laughs> So we're gonna start with that, uh, installing Chrome driver. The easiest way to do that, good news and bad news, uh, for cross, across different environments is the NPM install. Just is what it is, that's the easy way to get that binary on, uh, for your team um, in, in a binary that works for every OS. Uh, second one, you've got the brew install, and thanks to some of Apple's new security updates, that's a little more fun where you have to authorize it uh, you can also just download the binary for, for your OS from uh, Google directly. From there, we then need to update the mix UXS. So you need to add the Wallaby dependency, and then I like to add an end-to-end an -end helper, or ETE. And the reason I do that is, again, browser tests are a little bit slower, so I like to segregate them from the rest of my test suite. Um, and I like to make sure that any of the JavaScript or CSS changes that I've made get uh, reflected in my test. So we add that ES build default before we do everything else that's a, you know, a traditional test run there. From there, we modify the endpoint. Um, we add the SQL sandblock, sandbox plug. So what that does is helps tell your test, okay, uh, I'm going to be routing different requests to a specific uh, transaction that's running so that all of your tests have database layer isolation from each other and can be ran concurrently. And this will tell your Phoenix to, to do that. Other key piece that's missing from the documentation right now, and this is one of the PRs I need to put up, is in the socket you need the user agent because the user agent is how Wallaby communicates to the rest of your application. Hey, uh, here is how to link up the database connection and your browser uh, to make sure that you're not getting back an empty database every time you try and connect. Uh, from there, the test helper, make sure that Wallaby's started up and that you know where it's going. And then again, I like to exclude from my default test end to end, but that's up to you, um, just for the sake of speed and my, my personal flow. Now we're configuring the test file. You gotta start up uh, that server true. You need to tell uh, Phoenix to actually boot up an HTTP server in the test environment. Uh, tell your application to use the SQL sandbox, and then configure Wallaby. And we'll get into some of these other things here, but uh, we've got the screenshot on failure, which is we're gonna showcase, but it shows you a little bit about how your tests are failing, uh, whether you're running the browser in a way that you can see it or in a headless mode, um, as well as the configuration for the Chrome driver here. And again, headless is actually gonna mean that no browser window uh, becomes visible to you. Uh, which is useful for not having it pull focus and mess up your flow. Um, but the uh, headed mode, uh, or you know, headless false, is really interesting because it actually boots up the browser window in a way that you can see it running through the whole test suite. 
Um, and that can be really useful if you've got something to debug and maybe the screenshots aren't quite doing it for you. The other piece uh, that we need is this on mount hook. So Sophie went over this a uh, little bit yesterday with the live session helper. Uh, but we once again need to be able, uh, live view adds a little, an additional layer of complexity here with making sure that on each mount that you're wired up to the proper SQL sandbox. Uh, and so here, thankfully, you no longer have to add this to every single mount call. You can just add this to the session helper. Um, and then from there, it'll wire up uh, your test environment properly. Um, this one was, was a fun one to track down because you actually had to you know, go across some issues in Wallaby, Phoenix Live View, and Phoenix Ecto to you know, figure out that this was, this was all missing um, from the documentation for getting things to run asynchronously. And again, want to, want to remedy that. Um, but out of the box works uh, synchronously great. But uh, you know, we need to go faster. So, <laughs> uh, finally, I like to set up a, a helper, just like the data case or the con case that gets generated for you with Phoenix. And again, this is where I tag it with the module tag end to end to make sure that they're isolated. A um, little bit of a spoiler, I also add a helper for enabling latency. We'll talk about how that can be useful a little bit later. But we can leverage the uh, tools that LiveView gives us for testing latency as a user in the browser as a robot in the browser, uh, which, is, which is pretty cool. So um, this is just one to get us started. And this is probably one where you don't want to use uh, Wallaby 4 because Floki can test this. There's no like, meaningful JavaScript interactions here. But I, I wanted to just use this to showcase how easy it is. Um, so you have the feature block there on line 8 which so showcases um, the test helper keyword that, uh, that they use in this repo, or in, in this project. And then the session is passed in from the setup block that gives you an actual browser session. And you can see it's totally pipeable. You can visit a URL, and you can use a route helper or a, you know, an actual string. Uh, you click various links or buttons, fill in text fields or other types of fields, and then click Save. Uh, the only thing that might look a little foreign is Assert Has rather than Assert. Uh, and that's just a helper that Wallaby gives you to you know, introspect that HTML and see, OK, um, does this have what I'm looking for here? Uh, going back to that, the screenshots on failure, this is what it will look like if you don't wire up your database. <laughs> so. Uh, with that SQL sandbox. But again, uh, on each failure, it'll go through and take these um, and go from here. And I, I realized in my notes I forgot to mention, all of the tests that I've written here are just based off of the uh, Phoenix Live View generators here. I haven't done anything uh, special. This is just a vanilla Phoenix project that's been booted up, and we're adding some tests to that to just help you get started uh, with this. So that's why, uh, why it's a little more on the boring side here. Um, but again, you can use this to queue you in on, OK, I just created a question, and there are no questions here, so there's something going on here that I need to take a look at. Uh, then you can get into where uh, Wallaby's actually a differentiator is in testing the JavaScript uh, on your application. Now, once again, this is a little bit of a trivialized example and is testing the confirmation dialog. You know, we haven't implemented soft deletes yet, so we want to let the users know hey, if you click this delete button, are you sure it's going to be gone? I can't recover this for you. Uh, and with that, uh, we want to make sure that the, you know, we've got the request from the product manager that it has to be, are you sure? Nothing else will do. Um, otherwise, we're out of compliance or something, right? And so you can then have that assertion that, hey, you're going to prompt the user, are you sure? And then the question is, in fact, deleted. Um, and you can, you can do this as you start testing JavaScript. Uh, using like Jest or Mocha or something like that uh, if your application is more involved. But you and your team, again, may not want to take that plunge. You, you probably want to keep things, uh, reduce the amount of context that you have to keep available to you and your team. And so this gives you tools to do that. And you know, if you don't need all of the um, tooling available for you from those ecosystems, you no longer have to reach for that. Now, one of the ways that um, Wallaby really shines and for me becomes really interesting, especially in the live view context, 
for building applications with collaboration is it allows you to drive multiple browsers, which is not possible with Cypress, and at least last I looked um, in a lot of the other um, testing environments like uh, Capybara, which is analogous in the Ruby environment, um, you couldn't drive multiple browsers, but you can do this here to test, okay, uh, we're building a collaborative application now. We want these real-time question and answers and people to be able to see it. You can test that scenario as well here and ensure that that works in a, again, high-fidelity environment rather than having to you know, fake the interactions of one user to test against another. Uh, so uh, we're going to talk first a little bit about the PubSub. Um, one of the other folks uh, mentioned how we can add PubSub functionality. That's in the code base, but I'm not going to go over that piece of code right now. What I am going to go over is the multiple browsers. So we can see we add that module attribute for two sessions. And this test we're dealing with is, OK, a uh, user has a question that's been submitted. One, another user edits that question, and the um, you know, session two here doesn't see that reflected in the index. But if they click edit, then they get the, the new question text. That's a weird user experience. Uh, we don't want that. We want our users to have a seamless experience. So we can add a test for that here. We can see session two visits the question URL. Um, session one goes in and modifies the question. And we can make sure that the new text arrives. And you can do this at lower levels of the stack with like assert receive or anything like that, testing your context for um, pub sub functionality. But once again, you may not wire that up correctly. And so that's where, in my mind, this can be uh, valuable for us. Uh, and now we want more functionality, right? We want uh, JavaScript. So the user, in this case, sees that the question that was just modified, it gets highlighted in yellow, uh, because I'm really creative with these tests. And so the, uh, and then that, that highlight fades after a few seconds, so that it's not just permanently yellow for the user. So you can see, otherwise, it's the exact same test that we just had. Uh, but we can also assert that the styles have changed, or any of the HTML interactions uh, that are facilitated via JavaScript are there, um, including with the, just the, that sleep in order to say, OK, two seconds pass, and that goes away, um, which does add time to your test suite. But on the flip side, this test is running asynchronously, so it's only going to add two seconds um, if, there's, if it's the slowest test in your suite. Uh, so I've got a video of this. Hopefully it works. There we go. This is actually Wallaby running um, on my computer. You can see this is the test, and that's what you get when you run the browser in a headed mode. Um, you can again see, did this work the way that I hoped it did? Um, and again, that one was even slowed down. I had put a bunch of sleeps in there, because otherwise the, brow the computer will just blow through that. And that was already a lot faster than I can consistently test that. So I'm feeling good about that. <laughs> we talked about this a little bit earlier with spoilers, but you can also simulate latency. And this is one with LiveView that, uh, as Sophie pointed out, we don't always think about enough. But with higher levels of latency, you can have your application be a pretty bad user experience. And that's something that's important for us, because a lot of our customers are like convenience stores or uh, fast food places that are out in the middle of nowhere. And so they don't have a great uh, internet connection necessarily. And so to make sure that they have a good experience, we want to simulate latency. And that isn't something that you necessarily have to keep in your test suite, but is something that this is a great reminder for um, as you're developing your test. And if it is um, you know, a critical thing that uh, one of your scenarios deals with in a, low lat or in a high latency environment, uh, maybe that surfaces what happens when uh, editing these two questions collides? How do we want to handle that? I find this brings it to the surface and helps the team ask questions, even if we don't end up keeping this test around long term in the code base. Um, but as you can see here, once again, all the same. Visit, click a link, fill in some text. And then to make sure that the entire test isn't slow, you can inject latency only at the point that you actually care about. So again, this doesn't slow you down your whole test. In this case, I just want to see that when I hit the Save button, if it takes eternity for my, um, my test to return, that the user sees saving. They're not left hanging on knowing, like, hey, did this actually do anything? Or you know, what's going on? I can give the user that feedback that, no, we're working on it. Maybe your connection is just not great. Or maybe this is a really 
uh, time-intensive operation uh, that needs to run for a bit. The other thing that it gives you, and I didn't uh, add some slides on this, but it allows you to simulate mobile browsing by resizing the browser. So you're not going to get a perfect representation because there are some differences in the way desktop browser APIs implement um, functionality versus the way actual mobile devices do. But you can resize the window. You can use touch events. You can go through and ensure that all of that works, which again, for a small team like ours, uh, is invaluable because you can have one code base uh, via progressive web apps. And now um, Apple is better supporting with things like push notifications and things like that. Uh, that your team can test all of that as well on that, that path of, okay, maybe the, the mobile app's a little bit different and there are different use cases that are important for that. You can still test that, uh, once again, all from Elixir without leaving you know, your happy place here. The other thing that's been kind of fun for this is I mentioned all of that churn um, and context switching and um, some of the difficulty in React or you know, any other JavaScript framework of teeing up the environment in a perfect way to really um, simulate these tests. And so something I've done experimentally, but we haven't uh, fully bought into um, at Savvy, is you can actually test React using Wallaby as well, which for us means that you can wire up your database to the perfect state. You can handle server-side API calls and like validation, making sure that works the way that you need it to. Uh, while, again, staying in the happy place, <laughs> writing Elixir primarily. Um, that, that wiring that up to the database and all that means that either uh, traditionally in React, you're going to have a lot of mocks that are uh, fragile and don't give you a realistic picture of your application interacting with your server, or you're going to have uh, a lot of order-dependent tests that rely on you seeding your database in a particular way and the uh, application running the tests in a particular order, which uh, causes a lot of frustration for engineers as the tests break for unrelated reasons to actual functionality. Um, so you can actually avoid that as well, and this can be done with like, any flavor of SPA. It does take a little bit more work to set up uh, locally or in CI, and again, can be done with server-rendered um, React or any other JavaScript framework as well. Uh, but once again, just gives you that controlled test environment from end to end. Uh, final note going back to the like outside-in test-driven development is uh, nobody says you have to keep all of your tests around. Um, so one of the things that I like to do is uh, starting driving outside-in from the browser We'll write the test to say, OK, again, e-commerce example. I need to uh, be able to add something to the shopping cart and then check out. Well, maybe my test as I get going, I realize, oh, I can test this in Floki faster because it's not booting up a full browser. It's just checking HTML, and that's all I need in that use case. At that point, I can throw away the Wallaby test. It doesn't have to stick around if it's not adding value. And if it's slowing down my test suite, that's something that um, that may be worthwhile. Now, it may be worth keeping for you and your team. That's up a discussion for, for your team, um, just to keep that level of confidence up. But uh, same thing, or maybe the, the test can be better tested down one level at just vanilla X unit tests, uh, uh, the context level or the schema level. Again, you can throw away co the tests at the higher level if you feel confident, because that's what all of this is really about, is enabling you to deploy constantly and feel confident in your, your code doing what it, you need it to do. Uh, and so once again, if it doesn't help you and your team, just delete it and you know, move on. Final note with this is um, this kind of flow enables a, a bonus for me and my team of, of interruptibility. Now, nobody wants to get interrupted uh, while you're doing work as a software engineer. But the reality that we live in is that you will get interrupted, whether that's via Slack or somebody like kicking down your office door. It happens. And what this enables is you to have, again, a checklist of uh, and rebuild less context when you get interrupted. Because I can say, OK, um, I'm visiting this questions URL. And the questions live view does exist, but it's not pulling it out of the database. Now I know I don't have to go rebuild the state of everything. I can let my test suite hold that state for me and that context in, 
uh, run the tests when I get back from whatever the interruption is, and instantly be told, oh, that's where I was, and immediately start working there, just rebuilding less uh, context in my head at each point. Um, so again, using that as a checklist allows me to be interrupted more. And then if I'm not, it just allow, it allows me to have that checklist of like, okay, what am I doing as I implement this code? Uh, so in my mind, either way you win. <laughs> and so uh, in, in summary, I think that Wallaby, in addition to being a great tool in your belt for uh, helping ensure your application delivers the value to the users that you want, it's also a great tool for teaching yourself or your teams, test-driven development, and wrangling code bases that um, maybe are less tested than they need to be. Because again, you can take this, add the tests that ensure the critical path of your you know, brownfield project stays working. You can make the refactors to the, or the you know, complete rewrites to these APIs to ensure that things uh, are nicer to work with for future developers and then uh, know that, hey, did I break anything at least along this critical path? Um, and that allows you to gain confidence in your deploys, so you can uh, feel good about pushing at 4.30 on Friday and knowing that you're not going to get pages. Um, and that's really important to me, because usually I have to be a first responder to that, and I don't love it. So, <laughs> um, and with that, I just want to say thank you all, and uh, you know, any questions? <laughs> <laughs>